everybody, open your Bibles to the book of Obadiah with me today. Obadiah is a tiny little minor prophet, um, almost at the very end of the Old Testament. So if you hit those little books, you're, you're going to hit Obadiah in there somewhere. If you've been following along in the study, you're like, Lauren, you missed some books. You're right. I have been super busy here at work uh, and taking care of my mom. So I'm a little bit behind on some things. But here's Obadiah. I'll try to catch up with the other books that we missed prior very, very soon. In my study Bible, I have a chart here that lists uh, the kings of the Old Testament, both the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, and it lists the prophets that served under um, each of these kings. And so I like to use this kind of chart to let me know who is serving where and when they served. And if I looked up Obadiah on this chart, I would find that he began his service or he had his vision in around 586 BC. 586 is the year that Jerusalem, the kingdom of Judah falls to the Babylonians. It's a very sad year in Israel's history. And Obadiah is there writing them a letter, writing them this book so that they have something to uh, use to remember the Lord with and remember what the Lord is going to do. If you open up the book of Obadiah, you'll see that there's no big chapter number there in our study. And you're like, whoa, what chapter are we going to? Well, that's because it's only one chapter. So it doesn't need chapter numbers. It's a tiny little book. But boy, does it pack a lot into this one little chapter. If you go with me to chapter 1, verse 1, we'll get the beginning of it and we'll see where we're going with this, okay? So this is the beginning of the book of Obadiah. It says, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We're going to stop there because it seems like this whole book is concerning Edom, and it really is Edom and its relationship with Judah. Who is Edom? You may not have ever heard of that nation before. To find that out, we're going to have to go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, which is known as Genesis, to get a little bit of history. Because the Edomites have to come from somewhere, and we have proof of where they came from. So if you will look with me in Genesis chapter 25, you can hit the balls button if you want to flip back all the way to the beginning. But we're going to start in Genesis chapter 25, verse 21, to find the beginning of, well, not only um, Israel and Judah, but the beginning of Edom. Verse 21, it says, And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his, pr his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So here we have a man named Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, who cannot have children. But this man is praying for his wife, praying for future children, and God delivers, and she becomes pregnant. Verse 22, the children struggled together within her. So she's having twins. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So she's having these twins and they're battling out in her stomach. And she's thinking, what in the world is going on here? And God says, you know what? It's not just two brothers within you. It's two future nations. And they are battling. I wonder how she felt about that news. Verse 24. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. And afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. To help you trace a little family history, Isaac is the son of Abraham. Abraham was given a promise that God was going to make him a nation as numerous as the stars. And remember, he had Isaac, and he, he Isaac was the one that he actually, God told him to take up on the mountain to sacrifice to him. But of course, God stayed his hand and didn't let him kill him. So now this Isaac has grown up, and his barren wife has just given birth to two twin boys, Esau the older and Jacob the younger. And if you remember any of the passage of Genesis that talks about what happens to these boys as they grow up. Jacob is jealous of Esau being the older brother because the older brother gets the blessing. 
Jacob wants it. And Jacob sneakily comes up with this plan where he dresses up like his brother and he goes into his old father who's blind and he takes the blessing for himself. And the brothers begin to war against each other. And these two brothers would grow up to form, to be the fathers of nations. Jacob, of course, would be the father of Israel and Judah. Esau would be the father of Edom. So Edomites come from this brother Esau. So two warring brothers make for two warring nations. What's going on in Obadiah that here we are thousands of years later hearing about Edom and God is addressing Edom in this book? There's a lot going on. In the year 586, which is when Obadiah receives this vision, uh, Jerusalem has fallen to Babylon and Edom was on the sidelines cheering. Yeah! Yeah, take them, Babylon, take them, because they're enemies. And he, they do not want enemies to prosper. Not only that, but once the Israelites have been removed from Jerusalem, the Edomites go in and loot from the temple and the city. And they take their sacred objects and um, all kinds of, of wealthy things, things that meant a lot to the, the Jewish people, and they steal those. So they've looted the city. And not only that... But the third thing that the Edomites do is they serve as border guards for Babylon. And what that means is Babylon has all the Jewish people in their city, some serving as slaves and those kind of things. And if any of them try to sneak out and escape to go home to Jerusalem, which is where they really want to be, it's the Edomites that are kind of patrolling and picking them up and taking them back into captivity in Babylon. It's awful. It's an awful relationship between these two nations, Edom and Israel. So God's going to give Obadiah this vision concerning the Edomites. The uh, people of Israel and Judah have had their punishment for turning from the Lord. They are now in captivity in Babylon. They've taken it. Um, but Edom has not had their punishment for how they're treating God's people and his city. And so there's got to be a reckoning. And Obadiah writes this, and, and God gives him this vision to talk about that reckoning for the city, the nation of Edom. Okay. All right. So let's look at chapter one, verse one. Let's start again. See if we have a little more clarity about why we're talking to Edom right now. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up! Let us rise against her in battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. That's worth underlining. You will, who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, you say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. So Edom is a prideful nation, and they have thought they were better than the Jewish people, and they thought they were good without God. And so their pride has deceived you. It talks about how they have they live in the clefts of the rock. And what that is concerning is when they began to help Babylon. Uh, capture these people. Babylon gave them a huge tract of land. It's where modern day Palestine is today. And that tract of land had a place called Petra on it, has a place called Petra on it. And it's almost like a rock fortress. And so it's almost impenetrable. There's this one way in and one way out. Um, and that's what they're taught. That's what God is talking about. He's saying you live in that impenetrable fortress. So you think you think you're above everything and you soar like an eagle. You're just on high, high cloud right now. But from there, I will bring you down. He said there at the end. Let's go to verse 10. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates, they're talking about Jerusalem, and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother 
in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. So God is being very bold with his words. Do not, do not, do not, do not take my people back to Babylon. Do not loot from my city. He is very clear with Edom through the words of Obadiah. Do not do these things. They continue to do them. Verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations and you have done as you have done. It shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. But, so he's saying, Edom, you're going to be like you've never been. But in Mount Zion, that's God's place, there shall be those who escape and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Dang. So he's saying, you know, Edom, your just punishment is coming. But my people, I'm going to be gracious to them, and I'm going to be merciful to them. And that's what a people in exile needed to hear. They needed to hear that what they were going through wasn't going to be in vain. That if they turn their hearts back to him, he is going to have mercy on them. And that's the message that Obadiah gives them. That there's going to be judgment on Edom. What happens to Edom? We talked a little bit about Petra and the land that they were given. They continue to live there very prosperously for about four to five hundred years after this prophecy in Obadiah is spoken. What? But wait a minute, God said he was going to reduce them to stubble and, and destroy them, you know. Um, and God always keeps his promises. He always keeps his word. It just may not be in the time that we think it should be. Because here when Christ is born, Edom is still there, still a thorn in the side of the Jewish people, still warring against them, still battling against them from Petra. Well, Christ is born People were wanting a warrior hero to help them with problems like Rome and Edom and those places. But he's not. He's a savior of an entirely different kind. He lives a sinless life. He goes to the cross to die for our sins. Three days later, he's resurrected. And the new church is formed. And believers begin to grow and develop in their faith. And still, Edom, four or five hundred years later, is, is thriving. But their pride is going to get them. The pride of their heart is going to deceive them. Because in the year 70 AD, Rome is in charge of the area of Jerusalem. Well, Edom decides they're going to go and rob the temple again. They're going to go take some things from the temple from Jerusalem. They crave that. So they go in and they do it. But Rome clamps down like a vice on the Edomites and completely destroys their nation, and they do not exist anymore. While it took four or five hundred years for this prophecy to come true, it did, and there are no Edomites to this day. God always keeps his promises. He promised his people that he would care for them even in exile, and he did. And he promised his warring people that there would be judgment, and there was. Who sides you on? I'll stick with the Lord.